Alleluia! Christ is risen! seated. I want to welcome you to this Easter service of worship here at First Presbyterian Church, where we serve Christ by cultivating mission, inclusion, and community. For those of you who are, are visiting this morning, um, we do have some visitor's cards. If you would like to give us some information about yourself, we encourage you to do that, and you can just leave them in the pews afterwards. Um, I want to thank all of you who gave money for the beautiful flowers that are up here, as well as those of you who came up here yesterday and spent hours unpacking, arranging um, to make it look this beautiful. But a couple of other thank yous. I want to thank Andrew and the choir for Friday night. Um, powerful, moving service. And I want to thank all of our musicians who are here with us this morning. You guys were great at 8.30 and fabulous, and thank you for being here. A reminder uh, that we are still receiving one great hour of sharing offering. It's a national offering of the Presbyterian Church USA. All the money goes out to help others outside of this church. None of it stays here. Um, and as I said a couple of weeks ago, this church... Um, though we are not one of the biggest churches, uh, has been one of the leading churches in giving to one great hour of sharing uh, across the history of the offering. And so we hope that uh, we can continue that tradition.
finally, you all should have received uh, a flyer about our Ukraine relief efforts. Um, this is thanks to the Burke family. Um, they are sort of heading this up. Uh, Kevin, who is the father of the family, he has an, his company has an office in Poland um, just across the border. And so as the more than 300 children a day come across unaccompanied, um, they are in need of many things. And this is an opportunity for all of us to participate and to help make new lives for these children. So please take a look at the flyer. It tells you what's needed and how you can do that. And now with those announcements made, I'm going to invite all the children to come and just sit up front. Come on up front, guys and gals. Come on up and spread on out. You can spread across the whole front of the church. Come on down. Come on down. So, do you all remember what's in here? Anyone know what's in here? That's right. What's in here are the Alleluia's. Can you all say Alleluia? Yeah, and we say hallelujah to praise God. And, and all the past six or seven weeks, these hallelujahs have been buried in here because we weren't supposed to say hallelujah. But now this morning we can say hallelujah. Absolutely. And so, uh, Miss Cindy has some things that she's going to tell you about the hallelujahs and what you're going to be doing. Okay. I don't know if you noticed when you walked into the church today, but there were little alleluias scattered throughout the church, maybe on the walls, or I'm not going to tell you all the secret hiding places, but there were lots of alleluias. Your job after church today is to find all of those alleluias, and then after all the people are gone from this room, you can come back here and find all the little hearts that are on the uh, seats. I'll tell you more about those later. I think Miss Bethany's gonna tell yep. the rest of the congregation about them. But your job is to find all of the surprises. The resurrection was a surprise, and this is a surprise. Okay, and so. So let's pray, and then you all can follow Miss Cindy out to do some great fun things for Sunday school. Can you guys pray with me? Thank you, God, that you raised Jesus. You raised Jesus. And he lives today. And he lives today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we go anywhere, children, think about where your parents are right now because we are going to return before the service is over. So think about where they are. We'll find them when we come back. Okay. Did you know that there's a song called Caleb and it's about God? Oh, it is, it is isn't it? Yes. All of you are welcome to take one of those hearts home because inside that paper are seeds that will grow. If you put them under the ground about a quarter of an inch uh, in a couple of days, you will have some beautiful flowers. It's a reminder to us that sometimes the things that are most beautiful and the most valuable in our lives are things that we have to bury first and wait for them to grow. So please uh, join me in this unison prayer of adoration. We praise you, God of life, that Easter is not about a people, but all people, that because the tomb is empty, sin and its power in the world are broken, that because Jesus is risen, 
we no longer must fear death, that because there is new life, we can become people of boundless possibilities. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. of worship, we invite the Spirit to come into our presence, into our hearts, so that as we hear, we hear those words as the Spirit would like us to hear them. So please join me in this unison prayer for illumination. The Lord be with you. O oh, risen Christ, open us to the power of your resurrection as we hear it proclaimed anew this day that we too might rise to new life in you. Amen. Our epistle lesson today comes from the first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 15, verses 1 through 11, will be how Paul greets them and reminds them about the power of this day. So let us listen to these words. Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters and siblings of good news, that I proclaimed to you which you in turn received, in which also you stand, through which also you are being saved if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, and then he appeared to more than 500 siblings at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace towards me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is within me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe. The word of the Lord.
Thank you, choir, musicians, that was great. We turn our attention now to uh, the 24th chapter of Luke, the first 12 verses. This is Luke's retelling of what we would call Easter morning. So let us listen to the word of the Lord. But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they came to the tomb, taking the spices that they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they didn't find the body. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here, but he's risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified, and on the third day, rise again. Then they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all this to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told this to the apostles. But, but these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they didn't believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves. Then he went home amazed at what had happened. The word of the Lord. He and his crew had left earth and traveled millions of miles looking for an inhabitable planet. And when they finally found one, they landed, and as they came in and landed, they saw that the civilization that was there was not nearly as advanced as theirs. And so when the rocket landed, they expected the people from the local town, close to where they landed, to come out and see this ship. But nothing. No one came out, no one greeted them. It seemed like no one was curious. Now, they thought, well, maybe the people are scared after all. <clears throat> They've never seen a spaceship come down from, from the sky. But when they looked out through binoculars at the city, what they realized that people were just going about their everyday lives. No one seemed scared at all. So finally, the captain decided he would send his lieutenant into the city, take his universal translator, a la Star Trek, universal translator into the city to find out what was going on. Well, the lieutenant comes back and the captain says, well, why haven't they come out to see us, to see this amazing rocket ship? And he said, well, because our landing is simply inconsequential to their lives. And the captain was puzzled. How could that be? How could the landing of a, of a starship be inconsequential to the lives of all of these people? And the lieutenant replied, well, it's inconsequential because, well, last week a man arrived and this man began healing people and comforting the poor and confronting the powers. And suddenly a world that had been in distress became a world in which there was peace. And the captain really was not ready to believe that such a thing was possible. And then the lieutenant continued and he said, listen, these people said they had been waiting for maybe a million years for this man to arrive. And the captain said, no, it, it, it couldn't be. It, 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 it can't be that man. I need proof. I need proof that what they say is true, that this man actually healed people and did these things. So the lieutenant went back to the town and brought the mayor, and the mayor came out and, and said, yes, everything the lieutenant told you is true. And the captain said, I want proof, proof that, that these people have been healed. And the, Mayor said, well, well, here's my son. He had a withered arm, and look, his arm is just fine. Captain said, that's no proof. That's no proof. Anyone can say that. 
And the mayor said, okay, well, wait, we'll, we'll prove it. So send someone back into the city. They came back with a painting, no photography, no cell phones. They came back with a painting, and in the painting was the young man with a withered arm. And he said, see? And the captain said, no, no, anyone can paint that. That's no proof at all. And so ultimately, the captain goes into the city and begins to interview people, hundreds of people, thousands of people, and they all tell the same story. They all talk about healings and about being comforted and how this man has transformed their world. But the captain says, I have to see it for myself. I need proof. And so he said, I'm gonna get back in my starship and I'm gonna to go to the next world and the next world and the next one until I find him. And if I miss him in one place, I'll go to the next place and the next place because I need proof. And so he hops into his starship and off he goes. The story is called The Man, and it's by Ray Bradbury, and it's part of his collection of stories entitled The Illustrated Man. And it's Bradbury's way of wrestling with that sort of conflict within us as human beings between faith and belief and proof. Any of you ever wrestle with that, between faith and belief and, and proof? You know, I think, about, I think about what we've been through over the last couple of years. And by the way, I have to say, this is so wonderful. <laughs> Easter together again. But over the last couple of years, we've, we've wrestled with sort of faith, belief, and, and proof, right? So if you'd been wandering down the street two years ago and, and this person goes, hey, psst, buddy, over here, look, I, I have a cure for COVID. Just, just take this and you'll be fine. Okay, how many of us would have leaped at that chance? Yeah, not many. At first service, there was one. Right, because what we want is we want proof, right? We want the double-blind studies. We want the FDA to not just give it provisional approval. Some people said, no, nope, I'm going to wait for final approval, and, and that'll be proof enough. I mean, there are certain things that, that maybe faith and belief work in, but then there are other times when we wrestle with that idea of proof that we really want proof. And, and, and wanting proof is nothing new. Because if you look at our morning story, the, the women rush back. They, they, these, these men in dazzling white tell them that Jesus is raised, and they rush back to tell the disciples. And uh, most of the disciples are like, that's, that's ridiculous. And, and by the way, it's not ridiculous because it's women telling the story. It's ridiculous because in, in Jewish end times theology, there's no such thing as the resurrection of one person. Uh, the resurrection is for everyone. There's this general resurrection. So they thought this is just a, a, a silly story. But Peter, Peter wants proof, right? And so what Peter does is Peter, Peter's always rushing places. Peter rushes back to the to the tomb and he looks in and he says, it says he's amazed by what he saw. And, I, and elsewhere, he's confused, but he wants proof, right? And, and I think there are certain things that many of us really want proof. And so the question for this morning uh, that just really kept running through my mind this week was why doesn't Luke give it to us? Why doesn't Luke give us proof in the garden that Jesus has been raised from the dead? Because if you notice, in this story, there's no resurrected Jesus, which is fascinating because the other three Gospels all have someone in the garden that morning, Easter morning, meeting the resurrected Jesus. In the Gospel of Matthew, there are the two Marys. The two Marys meet up with Jesus and they see him and they talk to him. In the Gospel of John, it's Mary Magdalene and Mary Magdalene not only sees him, but she touches him. He says, don't cling to me, but it's okay, you can touch me. The Gospel of Mark, <laughs> in, in its oldest forms, has no resurrection story whatsoever, but someone really didn't like that. 
And so they add an Easter morning resurrection story to it. But not Luke. So why would Luke not give us the proof that we're looking for, this proof that someone saw and touched Jesus? I'd argue that there are two reasons for this. First, it's because we are where the women are, and Luke wants us to become what the women become. We are where the women are, and Luke wants us to become what the women become. So, we are where the women are. Where the women are, who, who, all these women who've gone to the tomb, they are absolutely and completely dependent on the witness of someone else that Jesus has been raised from the dead. Right? All they have are these two men in dazzling white clothes who say, listen, why are you looking for the living among the dead? He's raised. Go tell everybody. And they go. They have not seen Jesus. They have no, air quotes, proof. But that's where we are, right? I mean, we are dependent on 2,000 years of, of people witnessing that Jesus was raised from the dead. Just like Paul, when he is talking to the people in Corinth, he says, listen, he, Jesus appeared to Cephas, who's Peter, and then to the apostles, then to 500 people. And, and so you can trust this. You can trust the witness of these people. And, and that's where we are. Now, unless someone, some of you are not telling me something that you have seen the physically resurrected Jesus sometime, then, then we're all in that spot together. And that's really where all of uh, Luke's audience was. Because Luke is writing to Greeks who, who never would have lived in the Holy Land and would have had no connection with Jesus and no reason to see him physically alive. And, and the same for Paul. Paul's writing to people in Corinth who would have never been um, in and around Galilee and Jerusalem and so wouldn't have seen the living Christ. And so we are where they are. And so the story of these women is our story, that we're dependent on someone else witnessing to someone else, to someone else, <laughs> for the last 2,000 years. But, remember, it's not just about us being where the women are, it's becoming what they became. The women became witnesses. And I would argue that, that what Luke is about is wanting us not just to be witnesses who say, oh yeah, Someone told me that Jesus was raised, now I'm going to tell you. It, it's more than that. I would argue that what he wants is for us to become the kind of witnesses that the Apostle Paul was. Now, Paul, in, in the passage that Reverend Bethany read out of the letter to Cor the first letter to the Corinthians, he says, and then Jesus appeared to me as if one untimely born. And if we read the story of it in, the sto in the book of Acts, Paul is not there in the garden or later where Jesus is up and walking around and doing things that Paul experiences this powerful presence of the risen Christ in a light in a voice, Christ is there with Paul. And it is that experience that Paul witnesses to throughout his ministry. And I think that's what Luke wants us to become. Because I would guess that many of us have had maybe not exactly that experience that Paul had on the road to Damascus, but that in a difficult moment in our lives, when we are not sure which way to turn and what to do, it is somehow in prayer that the living Christ becomes real in us and encounters us 
and changes us and empowers us to new ways of living. We experience the living Christ. Or or when we're in desperate need of forgiveness and, and we feel like we've failed all of those around us, and in prayer we experience that forgiveness just washing over us through the living Christ who is there within us and around us and beside us. And then there are those moments, not all of us have had them, when we sit or stand at the bedside of someone who's dying. It may be someone we love. It may be someone we know well. And as those people take their last breath, suddenly we experience the peace of Christ in that room moving in us and through us and lifting us. And we know that death has not won, but life is victorious. There is just this deep sense of Christ's presence. And that's what we're called to witness to. We are called to witness not just to some great teacher who once upon a time taught great Torah or some great Jesus as some great philosopher who had interesting things to say or Jesus as a good man who lived his life. What we are to witness to is that Christ is raised and because he is raised, he is present in us and with us and through us and touches us in ways a a memory or a story could never do. Now, the story the man does not end with the rocket ship taking off. After the rocket ship takes off with the captain who is just, just desperately needs proof, this is what the mayor says to those who are left. Yes, poor man, he's gone. And he'll go on planet after planet, seeking and seeking, and always he will be an hour late or a half hour late or 10 minutes late or a minute late. Finally, he'll only miss out by a few seconds. And when he has visited 300 worlds worlds and is 70 or 80 years old, he'll miss it by only a fraction of a second and then a smaller fraction of a second. And he'll go on and on thinking that to find that very, to find that very thing which he's left behind on this planet, in this city. The lieutenant looked at the mayor. The mayor reached out his hand and said, is there ever any doubt of it? And he turned to the others and he said, come on along now. We mustn't keep him waiting. And then they walked into the city. We are those who don't need to be kept waiting. We get to walk into the city and encounter the risen Christ in his power, in his presence, in his reality. And so the challenge for all of us is to be a witness, to be a witness to Christ through what we have experienced and to share it with those who may find themselves in need of someone to say, yeah, he's real, he's alive, he's there for you. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we are so grateful that you raised your son from the dead and that he is real with us, in us, and through us. Help us always to be aware and alive to his presence. In Christ's name, amen.
open our spirits together in prayer, pray for our world and ourselves. God of the bright and morning star, God of the rising sun, God of darkness banished, we praise and worship you. For empty tombs, thank you. For disciples running with good news, thank you. For your presence, alive, powerful, resurrected, thank you. We celebrate your victory over death, over all the powers that would defeat us. Today, as we celebrate and dance, we ask you to be close to those who are grieving, who as we speak of death being overcome, are not quite there in their process to feel it. Help them as they process the love that they have felt so that one day they can hear the good news with true connection and possibilities to the resurrection. We ask you for, to be with those who are sick and dying, who for them hearing about miracles and healing, it is hard as they wait for their wholeness. Send them those who can ease their struggle now and bring them to a fulfillment for their resurrection. We pray for places in the world that are torn by war, where the message of the Prince of Peace seems so far away. Keep people strong, secure. Send them those who can help and who can carry a burden with them. Help us all to grasp resurrection, to understand its power, to see its force at work in our world, overturning evil empires, changing the hatred within us, moving the world slowly but forcefully, bend, bending it towards love and truth. On this day of great gladness, empower us to be your ambassadors proclaiming good news. Good news in our kitchens and living rooms as we are with friends and family. May they be able to show up as their true selves and not be ashamed of how you have created them. We pray for the good news to be said in our offices and our workshops as we fulfill our purpose and our passion. We want to proclaim good news in the fields and the factories as things are made and built that make this life wonderful and extraordinary. Help us to be that good news, walking softly on this earth, caring gently for all people, living hopefully into your kingdom. In this world of broken hopes and dreams, we catch sight of your kingdom come. And in the person, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns forever in us, who has taught us that when we pray, we say these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
before we close, a couple of things. First, to the children, thank you for making this beautiful Easter cross. It looks fabulous. Second, please take flowers with you when you go. Um, take them, enjoy them, plant them, let them grow. Even if you didn't buy a flower, we have plenty of extras, take some with you. And then after the benediction, we're going to pass the peace. And this is how we pass the peace to one another. And then we ask you to remain standing for the Hallelujah Chorus. And now may the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in the knowledge and love of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And may the grace, mercy, and peace of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be and abide with each and every one of you from this moment forward and forevermore. Amen. Peace be with you.